All right, all right. Let's give it up to our first time guests who are here physically and tuning in online. Thank you for being here with us. Let's give a huge welcome to the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our Correctional Facilities Partnerships and to the TC family. It is so, so good to see everybody. We are kicking off a brand new series starting in 2024, which by the way, that just sounds weird, 2024. Um, if you're a teenager right now or a young adult, I remember when Prince wrote a song saying, we're going to party like it's 1999. That's a long time ago. I can't even stay up for that party anymore. So, but our series is, is, is entitled, My Name Is. Now, I must admit, I, I, I am a fan of hip hop. I grew up when hip hop first developed. Hotel, motel, holiday in. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> We're about to get into sin. No sinning in the house of the Lord. Um, so, my name is, does remind me of Eminem when he's like, my name is, so I'm gonna do everything I can to not do that every time I say, my name is. But one of the beautiful things about God is he describes who he is by his name. So growing up where I grew up at, predominantly African-American community, Latino community, this isn't true for everybody. It's not, it's a generalization. But growing up where I grew up at, nobody goes by their government name. So my government name is Derwin Lamont Gray. I didn't get called Derwin until I got drafted in 1993 by the Colts. That's when I became Derwin. Previous to that, everybody called me Dewey because that was just my name. And so we had people in the hood named Squinky. We had people, I mean, just all, uh, I had a cousin named Ice, one named Chili Red. I mean, so their name describes their actions. You probably have that in your family too. Well, one of the things that God does is he describes what he does and what he wants to do in our life by his names. As a matter of fact, we're going to unpack this just a little bit more. So teenagers, young adults, God, and when I say God, I don't mean the universe. The universe is an inanimate object. It is created. We can worship the creator of the universe who is eternal and personal, who's revealed himself in sacred revelation, which is the Old and New Testaments, as Yahweh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so God wants you and I, God wants you to know him. Let me pause here. You and I can actually know the living God of the universe. Not, not just know about him, like studying him under a, a microscope. No, no, no. Like you can actually personally know him. Now the problem with that statement is, here comes a big word, we're children of the European Enlightenment, which meant several hundred years ago, people said the only thing you can know is what you can taste, touch, and feel, and see, and those types of things, right? But God goes beyond that, and a supernatural something happens that, that he breaks through that and says, you can know me even though you don't see me. You can see my effects all around, but you actually can know me. One of the dangers of living in the South, and not everybody's from the South, welcome to the South where the winters are nice. Let me keep going. I lived in Annapolis for five years. Great city, but it was cold, man. One of the dangers of living in the South is people talk about religion. You can talk about Jesus, but actually not know Jesus. Matter of fact, James 2.19 says, even the demons believe, but they don't know him. God is inviting you to know him, teenagers. He can be more real to you than anything. But not only know him, but to behold him. We don't use that language much in our culture, but to behold something is to appreciate it, to, to find it worthy of adoration and worship. And here's the thing, whatever you and I behold, we become like. So Let's pause. If you're always anxious about money, even though you have a lot or have a little, you're always anxious, you're beholding money. If you are always feeling as though people are gonna leave you and, and you're not worth it, you are idolizing yourself. You're idolizing them. Whatever brings us the most stress is actually what we are beholding. And Jesus is saying, I want you to behold me because when you behold me, I take hold of you. And when I take hold of you, you actually become 
you. We are perpetually lost seeking an identity outside of beholding him. So, so God's names describes his redemptive action in human history. Big word here, big word. Uh, if you're new to Transformation Church, we use big old theological words here. You know why? Because they're in the Bible and they matter. But guess what we do? You ready? We explain what they mean. So I was trained, well, not trained, but the era that I grew up in ministry, we were basically told that the congregation can't learn, don't make it too complex, make it practical. I didn't grow up in a church, and I said, why? I'm like, there are kids who are doing algebra in eighth grade. They can't learn theology? There's kids that work at Chick-fil-A when they're 16. They can't learn theology. They're in AP classes, but we're going to dumb them down at church. That's our problem. We don't need to dumb them down. We need to call them up to the glory of God because the greater God's glory is, the more we want to worship him. Um, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I don't want to worship a puny God. I want to worship the God of Scripture who is beautiful and magnificent, and that requires us using big words but explaining the big meaning so they can have a big impact in us. So God's redemptive history, that word redemption is a beautiful word that we can trace all the way back to Exodus chapter six, verse six. Here's the deal. God called a people to himself called the nation of Israel. And he said to them, basically, I want you to be my people and I want you to show the world who are not my pe people what it looks like to be with me. I'm gonna show you how to live. I'm gonna show you how to love. I'm gonna be with you, and your life is gonna be like an advertisement to me. The problem was, there was a guy named Pharaoh in Egypt, this African cat, and he was like, listen, all you Israelites, you guys would make some good workers for the things I wanna do. So he enslaved them. God raises up a stutterer by the name of Moses who's like, G -g 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 I can't do it. And God's like, I can, so let's go. By the way, every time you say, I can't, he goes, I know. That's why I'm going with you. So Moses goes, the 10 plagues against the nation of uh, 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 Egypt was against the 10 false gods of the Egyptians, and the last one was taking the firstborn. Why? Because the Egyptian pharaohs thought that they were the sons of Ra, the sun god, so his son would be the son of God, and God was like, nope, I'm really going to bring the son of God through these people you're enslaving, and nothing's going to stop me from saving people. Put your name there. God goes through drastic things to set us free. Eventually, God redeems them. That word redemption means a slave was shackled and a price was paid. Ultimately, it points to Jesus who frees us. For what? To behold him so he can take hold of us. And what we're gonna look in this series is how God's names describe his redemptive purposes. This is a picture of me in Israel in 2017. It was my last class for my doctoral studies in the New Testament. And for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, I am a photographer, me and my Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra, which is about to be upgraded to Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. By the way, Samsung, if you are watching, I'm open for an endorsement deal. I'm just saying. I mean, I'm just saying, but okay, let me get back to the message. So anyway, I saw these uh, young people, uh, the girls probably about seven or eight, brothers about 10 or 12, and they were sh shepherding sheep. So I thought, man, this would be a great picture. Next thing I knew, I was with the sheep and the sheep were all around me. Now, I don't know nothing about shepherding, but I got enough sense to know this. The sheep saw me as a shepherd who could protect them and guide them and provide for them. Well, there was a shepherd boy several thousand years ago. His name was David. He was the smallest son of a group of brothers who were very impressive. He was the weakling of a man named Jesse. He was a shepherd boy. What he did is he shoveled sheep droppings. Can I pause here? Uh, please don't despise the years of shoveling sheep droppings we have a generation, I say this lovingly, hear my heart, entitlement will think you need to be king before you can ever shovel sheep droppings. You learn how to be king in the snitch of the sheep 
droppings. You learn how to be king when no one knows your name. Can I just testify for a moment? I will have high schoolers and college students, football players, hey, Durham, what did it take to make it to the NFL? What did you do? And they want to hear about games I played. I take them back to when I was in ninth grade and I ran a 5.2540 and I was five foot seven, 132 pounds and was not very good, but, but decided that I was gonna lift weights and I was gonna sacrifice and I was gonna run and I had hard coaching that I didn't think liked me. By the way, the, most, the coaches who love you the most work you the hardest because they see what's in you and some of us are complaining about the greatness that God wants to bring out of us through somebody else and so I tell them and finally about a half hour later, I said, by the way, my first year in the NFL was miserable, and they don't want to play in the NFL anymore. People want to show up when the lights are on, but they don't want to work when no one's watching. Well, God's grace works that way too. David was a shepherd boy, and so he could write about Psalm 23. And we learn about Yahweh Ra. I want you to inhale, Yahweh, Yah, inhale, Yah, exhale, way. The first breath you take is God's name. Did y'all catch that? Soon as you leave your mother's womb, soon as I left my mother's womb, the first breath, Yahweh. We're born praising his name and don't even know it. Yahweh Ra literally means the Lord is my shepherd. As your shepherd, Yahweh Ra graciously provides you with his presence. Graciously provides you with his presence. The Lord is my shepherd. And let's point here, graciously. Um, young adults and those of you who don't follow Christ and those of us who may have followed Christ for a long time, don't underestimate grace. Learn what grace is. Grace does not mean the shepherd owes us his presence. Grace does not mean we've earned it. Grace means out of the loving shepherd's heart, he goes, I'm going to be with my sheep. And if you know anything about good shepherds, on cold nights, they're with their sheep. When they're walking to water and it's dry and it's hot, they're with their sheep. When the wolves tack, they are with their sheep. The sheep don't earn it. It's a gracious gift. Never underappreciate the presence and the grace of God. King David, as he writes Psalm 23, you know that sheep are always under attack. I'm not sure if you know this, but sheep are not the smartest animals that God ever created. They're under attack from like wolves and all other types of things, and it's important they know where green grass is, and it's important they know where water is. Um, Israel is a very dry place, so that's very, very important. By the way, by the way, um, what would happen if there were like 300 sheep and a wolf comes, hur, 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 and instead of the sheep being scattered, they go, hmm, there's 300 of us and eight of them. Why don't we all just run at them? They don't. What you and I do as Christians, we go, man, I'm struggling with depression, I'm struggling with pornography, I'm struggling with my marriage, but I'm not gonna get help, I'm gonna do it myself. And the devil goes, okay, great, because I'm roaring and looking for you to be helpless and alone. Let me say something to you men and women. Doing it alone is not a sign of strength, it's a sign of pride. Let me say it again. You keeping it from your wife, what's going on at work, and you're about to get fired is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of ignorance and pride and dumbness. It is. That's not strong. You know what strong is? Help. Help me is strong. One of the things that I learned in my f f football career and what I've learned in pastoring is you ask for help. That's how you grow. Can I give you and me some knowledge? We know we're messed up. It's not a surprise when you ask for help. You're a human being. We are too confident in ourselves. When we're too confident in ourselves, we don't ask for help. And what happens? It's a whole group of sheep and we spread out. And what does the wolves do? Go find the little ones and the hurt ones and the old ones. And we just watch and like, ooh. But what if we all turn together 
towards the wolf with the shepherd leading us. A couple years ago, uh, Vic and I were going through an incredibly difficult uh, leadership crisis um, here at Transformation Church. It was gut-wrenching. It was the hardest thing that we have ever gone through. It was difficult, difficult. Now, Vicky and I have different personalities. Vicky is like, let's pull out the swords, cut off heads, mount them on spears. <laughs> and she balances me because I'm like, but babe, I just know if we, if we have one more conversation, they'll get it and, and we'll tell them about grace and, and God's good. They will get it. She's like, Pat, she's like, Derwin, you've had 15 one more conversations. It's enabling at this point. People don't respect you more when you don't have boundaries. They run over the boundaries more. And man, we were driving back from somewhere. I can't remember where we're coming from exactly. My phone rang, and it was my mentor, Alan Bacon, on the other end. And he said, son, are you okay? The Holy Spirit put me on your heart. Are you okay? And man, I just start crying like a big old 260-pound baby. But here's the thing, his voice reminded me of God's presence, which gave me assurance. His voice reminded me of God's presence, which gave me peace in the middle of the storm. His voice reminded me of God's presence that let me know that I had all that I needed to navigate this through Christ. You see, that's what Yahweh Ra does, is he hears his sheep's cries, and he does what a good shepherd does. He protects, he provides, he leads, he guides, even when we think he's late to show up. Some of you go, well, well, where is he? Question, are you smarter than God? I'm not. Like he told Job, where were you when I created the son? What if, what if oftentimes we think that God is delaying when actually what he's doing is making us stronger? You know the process that a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly? Caterpillars were like, ew, icky, and a butterfly were like, ooh, beautiful. Well, that beautiful butterfly used to be an ugly caterpillar. What happens? It goes through a process called chrysalis where it goes into a cocoon and metamorphosis takes place where we get the word metamorphi or transformation. A transformation takes place in that cocoon and then a point comes where you can see the butterfly stretching and trying to get out of that uh, uh, cocoon. But here's the, here's the thing though. If you slit it open and help the butterfly, the wings will come out deformed and too small and it won't be able to fly. Some of us are going, God, get me out of this. And he's like, your wings aren't strong enough yet. I want you to be beautiful and I want you to fly. Now, I don't like that. <laughs> but I love the results of that. Check this out. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. But not only do you have all that you need from wolves, you have all that you need to live an incredibly godly life. So let me pause here. Listen, this is, this, is, this is really important. The goal of Jesus Christ is not for you to get your dream job, your dream girl, and your dream house. What is the profit of man or woman if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Um, here at Transformation Church, we believe that Jesus' primarily goal is to make us godly people through his grace, people who are loving and kind and have integrity, that their word is their word, that they are the salt of the earth. So, you're not a slave to pornography. You're not a slave to your trauma, you're not a slave to your addiction. We're not. We are not what happened to us. Listen, you have more power and more strength in Christ than you realize. But here's what the dark powers wanna do and also the patterns we had before Jesus is how we would cope with life is the patterns that we had before Jesus called our flesh and we cope with life and also the dark powers, they want you to believe, no, you're just like your family. No, you can't overcome this. No, this is the way you're gonna be. This is the way you're gonna be. No, no, when Jesus bled on the cross and when the tomb was empty, 
You were reborn. So listen to me. Our first birth is through our mother's womb. Our second birth is through a tomb that became a womb to give eternal life. Eternal life is not just somewhere where we go. It is the power of God today, right here, right now. You are powerful in Christ. You're like, where are you getting that from? Bible, we like the Bible here. We, we, we believe it. His divine power, not Derwin's divine power, his divine power has given us, that's grace, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him, that's knowing him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Let's let the text exegete the text. That means pull out the truth. Let's start here. God is good. And because he's glorious, he calls you to know his son, which gives you the power to live godly because of his life inside of you. Jesus gave his life for you to give his life to you to live his life through you. I'm going to say it slow. Jesus gave his life for you to give his life to you to live his life through you. Would you stop trying to overcome whatever it is that is shackling you and ask Jesus to do it? You're going, but pastor, how do you do it? I don't know. It's not a formula. The problem with being Western people is we want formulas and patterns and God's going, hold my hand. Hold my hand. Trust me. Um, here's the formula. You need an ugly face cry. Lord Jesus, I can't do this if you don't. Lord, I can't heal my marriage if you don't. Lord, I can't kick this addiction if you don't. Lord, I can't do this. Lord Jesus, good shepherd, I need you to carry me. I need you to do it. Listen, I can't explain how I went from a 16 ACT to a doctorate other than calling on Jesus. I can't explain how the first wedding I went to was my own at 21 and being married 31 years later. But the name of Jesus, call on the name of Jesus. We need some desperate people not looking for formulas, but looking for the power of the risen God. Now, you do it all the time, no? You do. In a few hours, you're going to watch your beloved Carolina Panthers. You're going to do all kind of superstition, turn your hat on backwards, put on jerseys. You're going to do all this magical incantations. You're going to get mad at the TV, get mad at your wife, you ain't even playing, which I don't understand. Why are you getting mad at your wife and you ain't even in the game? I know, like I watch games with people. I'm like, hey, I used to play and you're getting madder than we do. <laughs> like we understand the other team is the best in the world too and they get paid millions of do do dollars. They're really good. It's really hard out there. Maybe you should try it. <laughs> well, no, you gotta give an inv invitation to. And this is like, man, you guys, it's hard. <laughs> he lets me rest in green meadows and he leads me besides peaceful streams. Our culture has soul fatigue. Everybody's tired. College kids are tired. High school kids are tired. Middle-aged people are tired. Young people are tired. Man, when you get in your 50s, you get real tired. You know why? You still taking care of your adult kids, and now you're taking care of your aging parents, and who there to take care of you? Even people in Sun City tired. <laughs> they just tired of being tired. But, but then also, you know what we're tired from? Living a double life. We're living a double life. We're, we're, we're tired. We, we think about a carefully crafted social media life that looks so much fun and the lighting's just right and the filter's just right and we want everybody to know how fun our world is and we're absolutely miserable. Do you know that research shows, you ready? This is true. Look, look it up. The more you're on social media, the more lonelier you are. Those are not real relationships. Research shows that depression in 2012 was here. Out of iPhone in 2010, it's gone. The COVID pandemic exposed what was already happening. I knew something was wrong in like 2011 when I would be out and I would see teenagers on their phones not talking to each other. 
We are killing ourselves. Please understand this, and I use social media. I'm not saying it's wrong. Please understand this. They want you to use their product. You are the product. They make money off of you. It's not free. It's taxing your soul. You know how many books you can read and how many things productive you can read instead of scrolling, looking at the same stuff? Why y'all worried about Cat Williams? You need to be worried about Jesus. I mean, no, 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 seriously, why? <laughs> Guys, seriously. Like, when has gossip been a thing for Christians? <laughs> when another person doesn't get to share their side, that's gossip you're participating in. It's gossip. And Jesus, Paul, put gossip on the level of sexual immorality. And we think it's funny, entertaining. We're entertaining ourselves to death making ourselves a blip. Go read a good book, like the Bible. <laughs> Jesus is like, come to me so I can give you rest. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Some of you are fighting so hard to prove yourself. And once you prove yourself, guess what you gotta do? Do it again. And then you gotta do it again. And then you gotta do it again. When does it ever become enough? It doesn't, and you live your whole life tired of trying to prove yourself. The cross is the ending of trying to prove yourself. It's where you can come and rest. Rest does not mean you cease from activity. Rest means that the activity of God begins in you and I. Number two, young adults, teenagers, preteens, Yahweh Ra strengthens and guides you through the darkest valleys of life. It's important for you and I to understand that as the shepherd is leading us, there are gonna be valleys of darkness, there's gonna be seasons of dryness, there are gonna be wolf attacks, there's gonna be difficulty, okay? But God strengthens us. Notice the verse here, he renews my strength. The Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit's power is our strength. And what does he do? He guides me doing, uh, guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. So what King David is doing is he's using a metaphor of sheep. In the Bible, the straight path is a path of godliness, meaning that through God's power, we're following him. Uh, we move from selfishness to selflessness. We move from pride to ego. We move from sexual immorality to morality. We move from greed to generosity. God is forming us along the right path. So what happens to a sheep if it's like, I'm gonna go off the path into the woods and there's a wolf there? It devours. By the way, some of you are playing with some serious fire right now. You got your little burner phone. You're talking to him or her at the office, beyond professional. And by the way, something tragic never starts out as like, hey, uh, you guys are gonna start an affair. Your kids are gonna be in therapy because of you, and uh, it's gonna be awesome. That's not what the devil does. Sin spelled backward is nice. If we knew the consequences, we wouldn't do it. A ship going from New York to London, if you just change a degree by just a little bit, by the end of the journey, it'll be in South Africa. That's what the devil does. So that ends today. All, all that nonsense ends today. It ends today. You're gonna walk along the right path of God's glory. You're gonna, you're gonna leave a legacy of faithfulness. You're gonna leave a legacy of love. You're gonna leave a legacy of integrity. You're gonna leave a legacy of the gospel. He wants us to walk in the right path. That's what the book of Proverbs says, some ancient wisdom from thousands of years ago. The way of the godly leads to life. Do you want life? <laughs> Living a life of deception is not life. Do you know how many lies you got? When you start lying, you know how much work you gotta do to keep those lies up? You see, what you're really looking for and whatever it is that you're doing outside of Christ is you're really looking for Christ, but you're not trusting Christ to do it. Friends, he's good. He's really good. It may not feel good at times, but I promise you, he is so good. And here's the thing. Sin clouds your vision. Walking in the way of God's grace opens your eyes to see 
clearly. For some of you, listen, hear, hear my heart. For some of you, your spouse is more handsome and more beautiful than you re- realize, but pornography has clouded your eyes. Follow him. He's gracious and he's good and he's kind and he is worth it. The other path leads to death. That's not just physical death, that's spiritual death, and we want to choose life. It got quiet up in here. <laughs> Next, Psalm 23, 4. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Guess what, guys? We're gonna be afraid. So I will not be afraid means, God, I'm gonna trust you, and here's why we're not, not afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. In life, there's gonna be some difficult things. Listen to me, young people, listen to me. There's gonna be some things that are gonna blow your everlasting mind that are gonna be incredibly difficult that you don't prepare for. Your mama not gonna be able to save you. Your grandma not, your granddad. No one's gonna be able to save your bank account, nobody. 2004, my wife was diagnosed with papillary thyroid, uh, papillary carcinoma thyroid cancer. Yes, we had insurance and that helped, but at the end of the day, there was no one who could help Help but Jesus. There were terrible worship songs I sang. There were terrible snotty nose cries I cried. You're going to come to a place that all you got is Jesus and you will discover he is all you need. Now listen, it don't make no sense until you're there. Now, a question that we get in our culture is this. If God is all loving, if God is all powerful, if God is all knowing, why is there evil and suffering? Why do we put God on trial instead of putting ourselves on trial? Amen. I think the question should be this. Why would a God who is all loving, all powerful, all knowing, come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, amongst sin, death, and ugliness that he didn't cause, die on a cross for us, raise again from the dead to kill death, and then by grace invite us into his family? I think that's the better question, is how can God be so gracious? Last I checked, it wasn't God who created adultery. It wasn't God who created sex trafficking. It wasn't God who created uh, corrupt political figures. It wasn't God who created all those things. It was us. Yet God says, I'm still gonna come and love you. The Bible says, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I think that's the better question. So when someone asks you that question, feel free to use that illustration because you'll probably get it this week. Check this out. I want you to marinate with me in Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. If there's one chapter in the Bible you need to know, it's Romans 8. Here's what the shepherd does for us. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Let me pause here. I'm gonna teach you what's called hermeneutics, interpretation of scripture, exegesis. Pull out what's in the scripture. Verse 33 through 39 tells us what the everything is. Do not hijack the scripture and make it be like, oh, he gonna give me that Mercedes Benz. (laughs) That's not what it's saying. Verses 33 through 39 is gonna tell us what everything is. But let me pause here before we get to, to that. When all hell breaks loose and we're in a dark valley and maybe the shepherd is ahead of us and we can't see him, how do we know he's still with us? The cross is still bloody, teenagers, and the tomb is still empty. And because the cross is bloody and the tomb is still empty, we can trust him that he is for us. We can trust him in the middle of it. So what is this everything he gives us? Here it goes, verse 33. Paul right here goes ballistic in the gospel. Who dare accuses us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us, praying for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it 
mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. As the scriptures say, for your sake we are being killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. Time out. The apostle Paul is a Jewish scholar. Yes, he's taking that to Psalm 23. No. Here's everything, y'all. Despite all these things, on the count of three, say all these things. One, two, three. No, despite all these things, overwhelmingly victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. Let me have a fit right now. Let me tell you what you've been through, what I've been through, even the pain we've caused, whatever hell is going on around us, you are not a victim. You are not enabled. You are not powerless. And the one who raised from the dead, he lives in you. He's calling you to call him. I'm here to tell you today. God wants to do something in you. Listen, I'm going to use a big word, zeitgeist. If you're German, you know what it means. It means the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age in today's culture is everybody's a victim. Oh, we blame everybody for everything. My mom did this. My dad did this. Well, what you do? What you do? What did you do? It's funny how we always tell what everybody did to us, but we don't tell what we did. When are you going to stop letting those who hurt you hurt you? And the one who healed you, healed you. Friends, I've been through things that I cannot describe from this pulpit because there's too many young people in here, and so have you. But I refuse, by God's grace, to give power to anything other than King Jesus. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Here's the everything. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God That is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the everything the shepherd gives us. As your shepherd, Yahweh Ra, is your host and pursues you with goodness and unfailing love. So when you read the original languages, it's kind of funny what's happening. So it's like, okay, we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. Let's have a meal. Yeah, it's pretty, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Check this out. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. What? David, what are you writing? So you're going through the valley and all of a sudden the shepherd says, time out, time to eat. As the sheep were like, um, do you see the wolves? Like, yep, I ain't worried about them. I got power over them. Have a meal, sit down. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Listen, the enemies don't go away. But you have a feast in the midst of it. Now let's pause here, this is really important. The enemy is not people. For those of you who know your Bible, if you don't, it's a great place to learn it. Ephesians chapter six, verses 11 and 12 says, Our enemy is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and dark powers. People are not your enemy. They're not my enemy, even though they may act like they are. You can choose whether if you enter into their circle of hate or remain in God's love. Now listen, Jesus said something really powerful Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, been in the Bible 2,000 years, hasn't been edited, hadn't been changed. It's the same today, yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. And it says this, bless those who persecute you and love your enemies. That is not a suggestion. That is a commandment. 
I don't know about you, but that's the kind of big boy, big girl Christianity I wanna be a part of. Some of you are waiting just to be offended. Your soul is just fragile. Will you let Jesus be your defender? We just sang a song about it. Well, they called me a name. When does a name have power over Jesus' name? Another thing, really quickly here. Can we retire the phrase, my haters? Can, I mean, it's played out. Can we please retire that? My Caucasian brothers and sisters over 50 are like, now what is this you speak of? <laughs> so in our culture, it's like, man, I got haters and these people didn't believe in me and my haters are my fuel. Think, of, think about how silly that is. You're saying your haters helped you achieve. They still get glory, they win. You're still thinking about them, they win. They written space in your mind for free and also it's idolatry and it's sin and you're using the wrong motivation to be successful. The glory of God should be our motivation. So can we retire that please? Can we be done with that? And we ain't standing on business, we standing in God's grace. Can we stand in God's grace please? The only business I got is the kingdom of God, the grace of God, the love of God. Boy, I wish I had more time. Let me keep reading. Yeah, somebody, I'll take your time. Nope, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> you honor me by anointing my head with oil. That means the Holy Spirit's power. My cup overflows with blessings. So think about it. We're in the valley. We're having a meal. God is going, and by the way, by the way, I'm going to anoint you with the Spirit, and you're going to overflow with blessings. Some of y'all like, praise God. What if the blessing is more patience? What if the blessing is more generous? Or what if the blessing is less pride, more selflessness? The blessing may be a better job, but that better job will become a curse if you don't use it to bless the Lord. Verse six, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. Now remember, this is in the valley, surrounded by enemies. Hello? <laughs> Quickly, let's do some theology proper. Goodness is not what God does. Goodness is what God is. So whatever God does, it's good because he knows the end from the beginning and his character is good. This word unfailing love is a Hebrew word called hisset. It is God's covenantal love equivalent to the Greek word agape. And what it means is basically this. God is saying, I'm going to love you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to see you home all the way. I am for you. All you need to do is trust me. His unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. King David, when he wrote, 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 wrote this, he wanted to make a temple for God. So right now, this is the tabernacle where God's presence was. The Lord said, build me a temple, but David decided to have an affair and messed it up. So his son Solomon actually built the temple. But the point is, he wanted to be with him. The point for us is this, for 2,000 years, the first day of the week, which is Sunday, God's people have gathered. Did you know in today's America, Christians attend one service a month. In 2024, make us go to three services before we launch our campus. Start your week off in the house of God. Now, I'm gonna challenge some of y'all. Some of you, as soon as travel basketball come, you gone. Most likely your kid is not gonna be the next LeBron James. You're traveling all over the country. Listen, I get it. I had a daughter who was an all-American cheerleader. I had a son who was one of the top football recruits in the country. When he was at 10 years old, their travel teams like, well, you need to bring him. No, no, he coming to church. Well, he going to fall behind. Well, that's all right, but not in church he ain't. And then they get in their tw tw 20s like, son, why don't you go to church? Well, dad, you've taught me for all these years that there's other priorities. No, the house of God and the instruction of God and the fellowship of the believers is the priority. That's what sets the dominoes for the rest of the week. Online is important. Online is important. We reach thousands of people, but we are called to be together. Don't make God's house, well, what, uh, this ain't a New Year's resolution thing, y'all. This is a consistent way of being. And I hope your son is the next LeBron James. He'll be able to give some great financial generosity. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Lastly, Jesus is Yahweh Ra, the great shepherd who sacrificially loves his sheep. In John 10, look how Jesus applies Psalm 23 to himself. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. Let me teach this for a minute. This is the Greek word ego and me, and it means I am, which is equivalent to the Hebrew word Yahweh. So whenever you see in the Bible, I am, Jesus is stating that he is Yahweh of the Old Testament. We believe that Yahweh is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Jesus, the second person in humanity, is saying, I am him. Isn't it sad that the religious leaders studied about Yahweh their whole lives, and he was like, whoop, here I am, and they crucified him. May that never be us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep, That's the cross. My sheep listen to my voice. You hear that? My sheep listen to my voice. Hey, moms, you know this to be true. You could be at the mall, you could be at Carolyn's, kids everywhere. But if your kid raises their voice, you know your kid's voice. Do you know his voice? Not just know about it, but do you know his voice? I know them and they will follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them from me. This is what I'm gonna do, family. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray, but I'm praying specifically for those of you who don't know his voice and today's the day to learn his voice. Let's pray. <laughs> Ah. in the name of Jesus the name that is above all names and the power of his blood for those watching online and those listening in person if you're ready to follow King Jesus the shepherd of the sheep if you're ready to enter his sheep pen of grace if you're ready to not only have your sins forgiven but to experience his covenantal love and new life his guidance his protection his grace With everything in your heart, in the silence of your heart, say this to him today, King Jesus, I'm ready to follow you. I believe that on that bloody rugged cross, it should have been me, but it was you. Thank you for taking my place to give me grace. Your blood forgives me. It makes me righteous. On the third day, I believe you walked up out of that tomb fully alive to fully live in me. I receive your gift of eternal life in Christ's name. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? In a moment, our worship team is gonna come and lead us in a worship song on Psalm 23, but before they do, if you prayed with me, I want you to fill out on the connection card, I pray to receive Christ. If you're watching online, there's a QR code that's gonna come up. Open up your camera app on your smartphone, point it there, and you'll get to the connection page and check, I pray to receive Christ. On the seat in front of you is a QR code as well. Point your camera phone at that, go to the connection page, check, I pray to receive Christ. Why is that important? Because we want to walk alongside of you. We want to pour into you. We want to see you be everything that the Lord has created you to be. He's a good, good shepherd, and he loves you. Here's our soul tattoo, family. Daily, trust and follow the great shepherd. Every single day, listen to his voice. Our action step is find your place at the TC. Uh, website. Just go there and we have it very clear for you to get plugged in. Listen, the Lord wants to change the world and he uses people to do it, people like you and me. And he'll do it because he's good and he's gracious. Okay? Now, on this flight, there's going to be a little bit turbulence, but we know who our captain is and we know our destination. Would you stand with me as our worship team leads us in a song on Psalm 23?